from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring June Allison and Jeff Chandler in Because of You. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. It's the frightening experience of some people to discover that a youthful mistake can haunt them all the rest of their lives. And in tonight's play, Because of You, we will tell you the story of a young girl who made the mistake of hiding her past and who lives a lie which threatens to destroy her future. And as our stars of this poignant drama from the Universal International Studios, we have June Allison in one of her most sympathetic portrayals co-starring with that excellent actor, Jeff Chandler. Now, Because of You, starring June Ellison as Christine and Jeff Chandler as Steve. I first met Christine Carroll in 1944. Like all newcomers to the state prison for women... She was brought to my office for an interview. A young, good-looking girl, first offender. She'd been sentenced for two years. You can sit down, Christine. This is Mrs. Gordon. She's matron here. We're going to put you to work, Christine. You'll be assigned to the textile mill. Now, we have better jobs, but it's all going to depend on you. I don't plan to give you any trouble. Well, I know that you were arrested with a man named Mike Monroe. Monroe was found guilty of armed robbery. Most of the money was in your possession. Is that true? Mike gave me a package. I didn't know what was in it. You were his girl, weren't you? We were going to be married, if that's what you mean. But you knew nothing of his criminal activities? No. You expect me to believe that? The jury didn't believe me either. That's why I'm here. Indeed you are. And the time you spend here can wreck your entire life, if you allow it to. I won't allow it to. Good. Just remember that I'm here to help, not to punish you. Thank you. That's all for now, Christine. Good luck. As the months went by, I came to know her well. This girl was no criminal. She'd made a mistake and she was paying for it. One day, shortly before her term was up... You wanted to see me, Mrs. Gordon? Yes. Miss Burke has an idea you'd make a very good nurse. Does that interest you? Well, yes, in a way. You've been studying hard, so your time here hasn't been entirely wasted, has it? No. No, it hasn't. Well, you'll be out in a few weeks. I'll try to get you into a hospital as a nurse's aide. Would you care for that? Oh, yes, I would very much. I'll see what I can do. I like you, Chris. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. That summer, Chris went to work in a veteran's hospital in Long Beach. That same summer, I was transferred. I was put in charge of one of the parole boards. Our paths would cross again many times. Christine's record at the hospital was consistently encouraging. But what I hadn't counted on was her meeting with a young officer named Kimberly. Major Steve Kimberly, a patient. Now, look, Major, you're supposed to be asleep. It's after 10 o'clock. Well, this is all your fault, you know. Who started giving me back robes? Well, I did, but that was... Oh, no, I can't go to sleep without one. Terrible situation, isn't it? I will rub your back for exactly one minute. How can you be so cruel? Now, look, look, you name your price, I'll give you a lifelong job doing this. (laughs) You may have to. The charge nurse catches me doing this, I'll need a job. Hmm. Haven't you got someone of your own who can do this... You? Well, I... I got a sister. Oh? She's pretty busy right now, though. Doing what? Taking care of twins. Oh, how nice. <laughs> They're brand new. She'll be out to see me, though, as soon as she can. Out from where? Home. Philadelphia. Oh, is that where you'll be going when you get your disability discharge? I'm not getting any disability discharge. What'd they tell you? Nobody's told me anything. Just don't get any ideas I'm washed out because I'm not. Look, Major, there are lots of men in the hospital who'd like to finish the war, but... I don't care about them. I care about me, and I'm not through. Are you going to relax or just argue? I... I'm sorry. 
You were rubbing my back, remember? So I was. Oh, it was wonderful. Simply wonderful. So I thought you could straighten me out on him, Dr. Breen. Well, it's nothing very complex, Chris. Major Kimberly's wounds, his physical wounds, have healed a lot more quickly than his emotional ones. He's suffering from melancholia. Melancholia? A period of depression. You see, he's had battle experiences that relate to painful memories from his childhood. He lost both his parents in a fire. And now, losing so many of his friends in the war... He doesn't seem depressed. Oh, he's getting along. He once told me something that's more or less the key to his whole outlook. He told me that everyone he ever loved left him. Still, in many ways, he's very fortunate. Wealthy background, no real need to work. Work? Then he's going to be discharged. A man with emotional shakes can't be trusted at the controls of a plane. Now, what's all this about? Oh, nothing, really. I I just thought I ought to report his conversation, that's all. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me something about you. I don't mind admitting that you... Uh, puzzle me a little. Puzzle you? A farm girl from Oregon? You're not one of the regular aides here, are you? No. I, I've been in prison, Doctor. I, I'm on parole. You? Prison? It's a long story. Ignorance, circumstances, falling in love. Are you still in love? No. Your family know about this? Yes. They, they wanted me to come home, but frankly, I'm too ashamed. I'm sorry. I've spoiled your evening, haven't I? Oh, no, no. Sometimes I have to think about it. Dr. Breen, could I have a few days off? There's a personal matter I'd like to take care of. On one condition? Yes. Just don't forget to come back here. Oh, I won't, Doctor. Thank you. Those few days off she wanted... They concerned a trip to San Quentin Prison and a visitor's pass to see an inmate named Mike Monroe. It's about time you waited long enough. You've been out for months. What's the matter with you? You look different. Your hair, those clothes. What are you wearing clothes like that for? There's nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong. You look like when you come off the farm. Maybe I've changed, Mike. Maybe that's what I'm trying to tell you. Look, what do you mean you changed? Well, I... I'm not in love with you anymore, I... I tried to make it last. Honestly, I did. I, I thought maybe... All right, all right, cut it out. You're getting yourself all worked up for what? You don't need to make a speech. Could have told you long ago we were washed up. Then there's nothing more to say, is there? No, nothing. You'll be getting out soon. Yeah. But don't you worry, baby. I'll do okay. I hope you'll be happy, Mike. You do, huh? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Jack, open up. The lady's leaving. Chris returned to the hospital. A few days later, Steve Kimberly's sister came to visit him. Like Steve, she was much impressed with Chris. And one afternoon as they walked about the grounds of the hospital... I wish you weren't leaving us, Mrs. Arnold. Well, I do have a home, Chris, and a husband and twin babies. <laughs> well, go on. Go home. You can see I'm practically cured. You know, Chris, I, I used to love this gal very much until she deserted me for that family of hers. You still do, selfish. Mm-mm. Well, not since I got Chris. I wish you meant that. Well, Chris, how about it? Oh, all men get fond of the women who take care of them. You're safe. That's Steve's trouble. He always plays it safe. Someday, Steve, grab yourself a girl without thinking. A man who thinks too long never gets married. Yes, dear sister, of course. <laughs> well, my plane doesn't leave until noon, so I'll see you in the morning. Chris, would you walk to the cab with me? Oh, yes, of course. I uh, don't really know how to say this. I don't want to interfere, but are you at all serious about my brother? You see, I feel Steve would like to like you very much. But if there's any reason why he shouldn't, please don't let him get too involved. Why do you say that? I've been speaking with the doctors, and they tell me emotionally Steve still isn't well. Yes, I know. Don't worry, Mrs. Arnold. Thank you, Chris.
interesting book, Kimberly. Oh, oh, oh Dr. Brain, I... I couldn't sleep. Oh, why not? Well, frankly, I, I was hoping Chris would stop by. I haven't seen her all day. I'm not surprised. She left here last night. Another leave? She's not coming back, Kimberly. I've lost a good girl. Well, I haven't lost her. Not yet, I haven't. Where'd she go? McCormick Hospital, Pasadena. Did they send her, or, or, or did she just go? That's something I can't answer. Now, how about getting some sleep? You're doing fine, Kimberly. One of these days, we're going to turn you loose. When? <laughs> no, never mind. We'll talk about it in the morning. Wonderful. You mean they let you drive all the way over here by yourself? Oh, thanks to a rented car and, and special permission from Dr. Breen. I, I'm getting out on Friday, Chris. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Well, we could go for a ride and talk about it, couldn't we? Oh, I'd love to, but I'm on duty in 20 minutes. Oh, but that doesn't give me much time, does it? Why did you leave Long Beach? Uh, I was transferred. No, no, you weren't. I, I've been snooping around. You asked to leave. Well, whatever the reason, what does it matter? If it concerns me, it matters. Are you so sure it concerns you? I have a feeling it does. Were you afraid I was falling in love with you? Why should I be afraid? That's what I want to find out. You're not in love, Steve. Getting to know people is one thing, but falling in love is another. Don't you want me to love you? If that's it, just tell me and I'll say goodbye. But unless you tell me... I, I... can tell you that. Don't you know how I feel about you? That you're everything I've ever dreamed about? Chris, I... I'm asking you to marry me. No. No, it isn't fair of you to ask me that. It, it isn't fair to yourself. What are you talking about? Well, you've been in that hospital for months. Why don't you give yourself a chance to lead, lead a normal life again? Normal life? You mean the normal life I used to live? I, I don't want any sort of life without you. But... We haven't begun to know each other. Just, just tell me that you love me. That, that's all I need to know. I love you, Steve. Like I've never loved anyone before. Go on, say it. Like I've never loved anyone before. <laughs> I do, darling. I, I, I do. We, we won't get married right away. No, no, not for a while. After all, you've got to go on duty. <laughs> Besides, it, it takes three days to get the license. That brings us to Friday. And... Steve... Yeah. There are things you've got to know about me. Such as? Well, such as... Oh, darling, please be sensible. I want to marry you just as soon as we possibly can. I've never shown such good sense before. I've waited such a long time for you, Chris. Don't disappoint me. I won't, darling. I promise you I won't. Later that same day, I found a message on my desk. Chris had telephoned. She was coming in to see me. I had to find out, Mrs. Gordon. What can I do? I'm still on parole. Then you haven't told him about being in prison. Uh, no. You've got to tell him, Chris. I can't. Then you can't get married. Not now, anyway. My parole period doesn't expire until December. Then it's simple. You wait till December. He wants to get married now, right away. What can I tell him? Chris, you're not the first girl who's had to face this. And he's not the first young man who's been kept in ignorance. The state has to protect him. That's why there's a law. A girl on parole cannot get married unless the Board of Correction gives permission. Now, I'm your parole officer. I'm the one who must tell him. Now, please, stop worrying. I'll give you every possible break. If I wait till December, then no one will have to tell him. Chris, don't get any ideas. I don't know what you mean. Wait till December? Maybe you will. But girls have been known to try it anyway. It's not worth it, Chris. A parole violation can send you straight back to prison. What has that friend of yours got to say about all this? That Dr. Breen at the Veterans Hospital? I don't know. Well, why don't you talk to him? I'm sure he'll agree with everything I've told you. Yes. Yes, I think I will. Wonderful. 
wonderful news, Chris. You and Steve. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Breen. Uh, Steve told me this morning, he also told me about his new job. Uh, right here in Long Beach, huh? Uh-huh. The uh, Cantrell Aircraft. Assistant to the chief engineer. You must be very proud of him. Oh, yes, I am. You're wondering, aren't you, Doctor? Wondering if I've told him about my prison records. Well? I... I haven't had a chance yet. When? You'll know what this can do to him. Yes, I'm seeing him tonight. We're going out for dinner. What are you going to tell him? Oh, I'm, I'm going to try to get him to put the marriage off, and then later, when he's stronger, I'll... Well, then I'll tell him everything. Put it off? <laughs> I see. Chris, don't marry him at all, unless you're prepared to give up everything else. There are no halfway measures for that fellow. Well... In spite of everything, he's a very lucky fellow. Well, I'm glad you approved, Doctor. Thank you. <laughs> I've got it all figured out, darling. I don't start the new job until the first of the month. You know what that means? It's three full weeks for honeymoon. We can either go east or we can Steve, go... Steve, yeah. uh, would it matter terribly if we waited till, well... Say until Christmas. There's no reason to wait. It doesn't make sense. Or or does it? Steve. Oh, of course, if, if you're backing out, I... Oh, darling, you're talking like a child. Maybe I am, but I, I love you, Chris. I, I want you. I want to be with you every moment of my life. And if you don't feel the same but way... But I, I do. You know I do. Steve, if we do get married now, will, will you promise to keep it a secret until December? What happens in December that's so important? My my job finishes, that's all. You know, I signed up for a year, and I agreed not to get married during that year. There's a shortage of nurses. You ought to know that. <laughs> okay, you will. A secret until December. Thank you, darling. Can, can we go up to Oregon and get married at your family's? No, no, that's, that's much too far away. Steve, what about Mexico? Huh? You know, we could go down there and be back in, well, in no time at all. And no one would ever know. That's what you want, and that's what I want. Happy? Oh, very happy, darling. I, I, I hope I can always make you happy. I'll never stop trying. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Today, one of our outstanding ambassadors of goodwill is Nelson Rockefeller, grandson of John D. With his brothers, Nelson has invested $3 million in a business partnership with South American nationals. The official title of this venture is the International Basic Economy Corporation, what South Americans call it El Plan Rockefeller. With American equipment and techniques... Among other things, Nelson Rockefeller has built a profit-showing fishery in Venezuela, a reconversion plant to turn powdered milk imported from the United States back into fluid milk, a food warehousing and distribution concern, a series of model and self-supporting farms, and a 300-acre hog farm. Throughout South America, the Rockefeller plan has set up thriving businesses, enthusiastically supported by the people and the governments of the two nations. Part of the plan's profits go back into other projects for food production and distribution, where little or no production has been done before. Part will help finance the American International Association, a non-profit organization set up to study scientific nutrition, sanitation, hygiene, and child welfare. In ten years, when the International Basic Economy Corporation is fully established, its stock will be sold to citizens of the countries in which it now operates. As Nelson Rockefeller put it, the people of South America don't want Santa Claus gifts. They want to be partners and, with us, do the job of helping themselves. Mr. Rockefeller knows only too well that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Because of You, starring June Ellison as Christine and Jeff Chandler as Steve. That weekend, they went to Mexico and were married. The honeymoon, of course, was something they'd have to leave for the future. 
on that Sunday night as they were driving back to Pasadena. Chris, I, uh, I've been thinking. You, you told me you left Oregon four years ago. Where were you before you came to the hospital? Now, you're not going to start checking on me at this late date, are you? Just curious. No. No, I'm not curious. I'm jealous, Chris. You talk so little about your past. I, I, I guess I just got to thinking I was the only one. Did you love him very much? It was a long time ago, Steve. It doesn't matter anymore. Nothing matters before you. When did you see him last? Not since falling in love with you. I won't ever again. I, I had no right to even think about it. Oh, you, you had every right. I'm glad you did. Now, what about you and, and all the girls in your sordid Philadelphia life? <laughs> there was one, you know, Rosemary Baldwin. And just between us, I've always had the notion that my sister had it all figured out that Rosemary... A week later, when Chris came in for her routine parole visit, I had some news for her. News? What sort of news, Mrs. Gordon? Now, don't be alarmed. Incidentally, I've been wondering about your young man. Did you decide to tell him? Well, yes, but not until December. Not till I'm free. Well, you can forget all about it. You won't have to wait. Mrs. Gordon? You've been given what we call a certificate of discharge. It's all over, Chris. No more parole. The slate's clean. Here it is. Take it. Do I... Do I have to keep it? Oh, no. You know what I would do if I were you? What? I'd take a match and I... Okay? Okay. Let's hope all your troubles go up in smoke. Just like this. Yes, Chris was free. She could leave the hospital now and become Mrs. Kimberly to all the world. A year later, a baby was born and their happiness knew no bounds. Kim was about three years old when Chris had a visitor. A man she hadn't seen in years. Uh, I figured you'd be surprised, Chris, but can't you even say hello? Mike, what do you want? What's the matter with you? Can't I even come in the house? Great way to treat an old friend, isn't it? Come in. Yeah. That's more like it. Well, look at you. You got everything, haven't you, Chris? Rich husband, good-looking kid I saw playing outside. Her and a nursemaid, huh? You must be real happy, ain't you? What's the matter with you? You're nervous or something? Your hand keeps shaking. Why? I just never expected to see you again. Yeah, well, you tried hard enough not to. I've been looking for you for weeks. Mike, please. If it's money you want, there's nothing I can do for you. I'm not so sure about that. Well, if you're thinking of anything as foolish as blackmail... You want to know something? I did think of it. But you're right, it's too risky. Except I am in a little trouble. I don't care. You have no right to be here. I'm asking you to leave, Mike, and if you don't, I'm going to call the police. Go ahead, call them. We'll make headlines, baby, huh? Kimberly wife, ex-con, house ex-lover. Go on, call them. What do you want? I've got to leave the country, you see. Now, what I want you to do is... Mommy! This. Oh... Mommy's busy, darling. Now, you run out and play. Hiya, honey. I'll come out in a minute, dear. Now, what's the rush? What's your name, honey? Kim. Mike, don't. Look, shut up. I'm not hurting her. Say, she likes me. You've got your looks. Chris, she's a real pretty kid. Mike, put her down. Sure, sure. There you are, baby. Now, you run along, honey, just like your mama says. Huh? Come outside, Mommy, and play with me. Yes, I will, dear, in a minute. You said you had to leave the country. You like the idea, don't you? Well, I... I don't have any money right now, but I... Wait a minute, you don't understand. It's not money I got that. All I want is an escort across the border, Tijuana. Now, that's not far. It's just 150 miles, maybe. What's that got to do with me? It's real simple. You and the baby, see? We drive down to Tijuana, we leave now, you drop me down there, and you'll be back in time for dinner. Now, it's not asking much, is it? It's fantastic. Is it really? Or would you rather see your husband's name all over the paper? Look, you start getting ready, Chris. I'm not kidding. 
Did Baby ever see one of these things? Mike. I just said, did she ever see a gun? Mike, please. We're wasting time. Go on, square things with the nursemaid. Like I said, you'll be back here by dinner time. Now, you use your head and your husband doesn't have to know anything. Oh, just one thing more. Your car. We're going to take your car. It isn't difficult to cross the border into Tijuana, especially if you're posing as a tourist taking your wife and child for a day's outing. But Mike had a plan. It involved a brief visit to a curio shop, just long enough to pick up a package. Mike. Mike, where are you going now? You said you were staying here, that you were going on to Mexico City. I changed my mind. I'm driving back with you. I won't let you. I won't. Now, you stop the car and get up. Shut up. Start yelling like that and somebody's going to hear you. You wouldn't like that, would you? Well, unless you do stop, I'm... Ah, no, you won't. That package I picked up, you know what's in it? It's dope. A hundred thousand bucks worth of dope in your car. So you calm down, honey. You and a baby enjoy the scenery. Back in Tijuana, the authorities knew all about Mike's visit. And as the car crossed the border, the police started to close in. The chase didn't last long. A burst of shots, a blown tire, and a sickening crash. Three hours later, Steve Kimberly arrived at a hospital in San Diego. You're very fortunate, Mr. Kimberly. Your little girl wasn't even scratched. We've given her a sedative, though. She'll be fine. Where's my wife? If you come this way, please. They had to remove some glass from her arms. We'll see if she's ready yet. She's still in surgery, Mr. Kimberly, hmm? so if you don't mind waiting, I've got a few questions. Oh, I want to see my wife. So do I. My name's Bergstrom, Department of Justice. Dr. Green, well, thank you for coming. It's all right, Chris. I, I've been speaking with the doctors here. You're going to be all right. Oh, I don't care about myself, but... That's not why I asked for you. Isn't it? You don't believe it's true, do you? I don't know what to believe. I I think it was inconsiderate of that Monroe fellow to die not to help you out of this. You know, Steve has taken Kim. Yes, I know. He hasn't even seen me. Why won't he come to see me? He will. He will. Chris, what power did Monroe have over you to make you do a thing like that? Well, I thought anything was better than having Steve not... Well, I guess I was wrong. But you must have known why Monroe wanted to go to Mexico. He could have skipped the country without you. Oh, it's so easy to be practical now, Doctor. I, I thought I was going to get rid of him and that it... Steve. You must be getting it down pat by now, Chris. Well, what else? Be careful, Steve. Go easy. You said you wanted to see me. All right, I'm here. Why didn't you tell me you had a prison record? Well, I, I, I thought it was best for you. That if best I for me or for your boyfriend? Was it he who advised you, don't tell your husband, and then when I get out, he won't be suspicious if we... That's not true. You know that's not true. How do I know? Because you tell me? Kim, risking the baby's life for your lover. I didn't. I didn't, Steve. You know that's not Steve, true. that's enough. There's only one thing to say to you, Chris. Get yourself a good lawyer. Chris didn't stand a chance in court. Her marriage was over. Annulled. My office was in the same building. She stopped by on the way out. Say it, Mrs. Gordon. Say I told you so. Give me time. He hasn't let you see your little girl. Oh, no, he's... He's taken her back to Philadelphia. The court decided I wasn't a fit mother. What am I going to do? Get a job. Where? Doing what? Who take me? Chris, a man came here to see me yesterday. A professional magician. He wants one of our girls for a job. It might be just the magic you need. I don't believe in magic. He goes all over, Chris. Theaters, nightclubs. Why don't I call him? Oh, I wish they'd send me back to prison. Chris. Well, if they'd sent me back, at least I wouldn't have to think about it. There, I know I couldn't see her anymore. 
Chris got the job. The pay wasn't much, but it meant keeping busy and constant change. The years went by. Two, three, four. Then one night backstage in a New York nightclub. Moving all the time, Chris. Yes. One of these days, you're going to forget all about me and go out on your own. And now, just what does that mean? Am I going to get a raise or am I just getting fired? Well, at the moment, neither. But about the raise... I think that maybe fame and fortune have finally caught up with us. We've gotten that audition for television. If they like us, 26 weeks at the price we ask. We see them tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Oh, isn't that what we want? Oh, I, I can't go with you tomorrow. Oh? What's more important? Well, here, look. The evening paper. Stephen Kimberley to join Aeronautics Commission. Leading jet designer to attend... Paris meeting. He's already left for Paris. So once again, you become the mother. Chris, I've told you a hundred times, even if you went there, they wouldn't let you see the child. But if Steve's gone... Oh, please, I've... I've waited so long. But if Steve's gone... Oh, please, I've... I've waited so long for this. I've just got to try to see her. Go ahead. I'll, I'll do the audition alone. You... Probably cramp my style anyway. Who looks at me when they can look at you? Chris went to Philadelphia. She took a cab to the Kimberly home, then a few moments later to another home not far away. Chris, come in. I'm glad to see you. Uh, this is my husband. This is Phil. Sit down, won't you? Thank you, I... You won't believe me, but I had no idea this was your house. Steve's sister, I shouldn't even see you, should I? But as Kim's aunt, that's something else again. Well, I've, I went over to the other house. They were just leaving, Kim and the chauffeur. I followed them here in a taxi. I, I really didn't come to make any trouble. It's the twins' birthday. We're having the party out on the lawn. If you'd like to go out there. Oh, no. No, not yet. How have you been making out, Chris? All right, I suppose. Susan... Kim was limping. Oh, yes, a little. Is it from that accident? Did she hurt her leg? The doctor says there's nothing wrong with her leg at all, that Jim, that Kim just enjoys it that way. Enjoys it? She's not a happy child, Chris. Perhaps that explains it. She just doesn't mix with children or with grown-ups. Does Steve realize this? For him, Kim is the sun and the moon. But doesn't he see that... Not anywhere but backwards. I've tried. We've all tried. Kim needs a mother, and Steve needs a wife. But isn't there anyone he's interested in? Come on over here to the window. Out there, the one in pink. Her name is Rosemary Baldwin. They've known each other for years. Someday, maybe. But... Where are you living, Chris? Well, I actually know where I, I travel. Oh, look at Kim. She's grown so... She's so big. Her hair's lovely, isn't it? Oh, it looks just like yours. And Steve... She's isn't? all by herself out there. Susan, doesn't she ever laugh? Not often. It's really pathetic sometimes. But it's not your fault. And whose fault is it? She wasn't like this before. Why don't you go outside? No one has to know who you are. I want to talk to her. Oh, do you think that's very wise? You said you just wanted to see her. I've got to talk to her. Chris, you'll only torture yourself. Please, Susan. Do what you want, Chris. I can't stand in your way. Phil? Well, she's Kim's mother. What has he told her, Steve, about me? He's always told her that, that you were dead. Isn't it really better that way? Yes. Yes, of course. What do you mean Chris is staying here in Philadelphia? She's quit her job and got another one here at McKelvey's department store. But when she was here last week, she certainly didn't lead us to believe that she was... She's not using the name of Kimberly, I hope. No, of course not. She calls herself Miss Dorothy. She's become some sort of a magician. Oh. She works in the toy department, and 
Well, they, they, they plan to send her to children's home to entertain at parties and things. Well, if Steve finds out... If... Steve's in Paris. Oh, Phil, can't you see? She's only doing this for Kim, to be near her, hoping that at some children's party again she'll... It just doesn't make sense. She may never see Kim. She could, if you'll let me help her. How? Kim's governess has a long vacation coming to her. And if we let her go away, if Chris came and took her place, well, there's no reason why Steve should ever know about it. (laughs) As for Kim, she could easily be that child's salvation. Do you realize what you're saying? Perfectly. Well, do what you like, dear. When something goes wrong, don't forget to blame your poor husband. can go to the house and you'll have almost two months with Kim till Steve gets back. Oh, Susan. Oh, no, I couldn't. I couldn't do that to Steve. But I told you he'll never know. I'll be responsible, Chris. How can I tell you how grateful oh, I am? forget it. I'll pick you up here at the store at 2 o'clock. Kimberly Residence. George, this is Mr. Kimberly. What? Mr. Kimberly, you're not at the plant, sir. Oh, no, no, I'm still in Paris. Let me speak to Kim, will you? I'm sorry, sir, but she's out at the moment. I believe they went to the park. Oh, well, uh, uh, how is she? Just wonderful, sir. I've never seen her so happy. Really? She can't miss me very much then, can she? I wouldn't say that, Mr. Kimberly. You're all she talks about. And when you're coming home. Well, tell her I'll be home on Saturday. I've finished things up here much sooner than I thought. No, no, no. Better yet, don't tell her anything. Not even that you called? Not a word to anyone, not even my sister. Very well, sir. Hell, yeah, we'll surprise them, George. See you on Saturday. We'll have Act Three of Because of You in a Moment. You know, every once in a while, the sounds of war yield to a nicer note. Such a one came from Korea, from the 27th Regiment of the 25th Infantry Division. It's an outfit of superb combat soldiers who built a legendary reputation in the Korean fighting. But they built something else along with it. When they were stationed in Osaka, Japan in 1949, they learned that a small orphanage was in bad shape. Poor buildings, little clothing, and no assurance from day to day that there would even be enough food for the more than 150 kids who called it home. Well, the regiment adopted that orphanage. They began to take up collections. They contributed food and medicine and clothing. And when the regiment moved to the Korean battlefront, the work went on. Their first payday in combat, those guys deducted a half million yen and sent it back to Japan for their orphanage. Well, you can bet those kids have never forgotten the men of the 27th. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of Because of You, starring June Allison as Christine and Jeff Chandler as Steve. Yes, Steve's return from Paris was quite unexpected. No one knew of it. Only George the butler who met him with a car at the airport. (laughs) This will be quite a surprise, won't it, George? I think you'll be in for a bit of a surprise yourself, sir. Oh? Kim, she's like a different child. I don't know what to make of it. It's sort of a blow to my ego, isn't it? I go away and she blossoms forth. Uh, Does she talk about me? Well, not so much lately, sir. She and the new governess, well, they're like Siamese twins. Now, what about this Miss Dorothy? I don't understand. I'm not sure I like it. Miss Susan found her, so Mrs. Anders could take a vacation. Yes, my sister wrote about her. Kim, too, as a matter of fact. Her wonderful new governess. I must say I thought she was all wrong for the child at first, sir. Catering to Kim the way she does. 
But perhaps that's exactly what Kim needed. Oh, not that you don't cater to her, sir, but, well, it seems different. Oh, can't wait to meet this marvel. Step on it, will you, George? Oh, well, well, neither did I, sweetheart, until a few days ago. Now, now, hold still a minute. Let me look at you. Oh, you look wonderful, baby. Now, who is that handsome young couple you were playing with? Judy Oliver and Bobby Latham. Oh? Their mothers don't mind at all if they come. All of a sudden, they don't mind. Oh, that's wonderful, darling. I'm glad. Auntie Sue says I'm practically a normal child these days. Oh, <laughs> you look out of this world, Angel. You know, I'm going to have to meet this Miss Dorothy and tell her so. She's gone shopping with Daddy Sue. Well, then I'll have to wait, won't I? Now, maybe you'd like to open one of your presents. Daddy! No, 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 take it easy here. There's something here for everyone. This one is for George, and uh, this one's for the cook, and this one is for the... They're here, Daddy. I can hear the car. Daddy Sue and Miss Dorothy. Well, then we'd better go downstairs, huh? Oh, please. Let's brace her tight. We can hide up here. Oh, no, no, wait. Hiding's a silly game. Oh, no. We play it all the time. Miss Dorothy likes it. Well, I'm a little old for this, but come on, then. We can hide in the closet. Kim? Kim, we're home, dear. That's funny, but she must be up here. Hey, it's straight, Sue. This is a big game for Kim. She's hiding. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yes. All right. Now, I wonder where that child can be. Under the bed, probably. Nope. Not under the bed. I've got it. The dresser. I'll bet she's in the dresser drawer. Well. Well, I don't see her. The closet, that's it. The clothes closet. Now, you know, she probably thinks that I think that she's... You found us. You found us. Look. Look, it's my daddy, my daddy. Steve. Well, what's the matter? Why doesn't somebody say something? Daddy, this is Miss Dorothy. And he didn't forget he brought you a present. Thank you. Don't you like Miss Dorothy? I love her. I love her. Kim, go downstairs, dear. Go outside and play. Don't you want me to? Miss Dorothy, where are you going? Miss Dorothy. Steve, now listen to me. Kim doesn't know who she is. She only knows her as Miss Dorothy. What were you thinking? You know what Kim means to me. And nobody's trying to take her away from you. She is. She already has. Why? Why did you ever permit it? It had something to do with pity. I felt sorry for her. And for Kim. And for me? Yes, I feel sorry for you too, Steve. You just won't face realities, will you? It's over, done. Nothing's going to bring us together again. And don't tell me that's not what you had in mind. This this was all you're doing, wasn't it? Yes, entirely mine. Well, thank you. If you're going after Kim, ask her to... I'm going after Chris. I have to tell her something. What did you tell her when you let her come here? That it would be a temporary arrangement until we knew you were leaving Paris. And that she was not to let Kim know that she's her mother. But even Phil was understanding and sympathetic. There wasn't a chance to know each other. Well, they've had it. I'm home. She'll leave right away. Are you... Are you going to talk to her? Is there any reason why I should? No. No reason, Steve. Kim? I'm here, Miss Dorothy. I, I just thought I'd take the dog for a walk. Do you want to come with us? I'd love to, dear, but I... I can't. Is Daddy still mad? No, oh, of course he isn't mad. Everything's going to be fine now. But why did he act so funny? Well, some people just don't like to be surprised. It it upsets them. Or maybe he thought I was a, a lot different than I am. Maybe he thought I was sort of big and jolly and fat. You're perfect. He's silly. Well, anyway, he's all over it. So you take the dog for a walk and don't be gone long because I'm I'm sure he wants you to be there. <laughs> Chris disappeared. Three months went by. Steve once again was the doting father. But Kim... Kim needed more than what Steve could give her. Oh, I don't think there's any need for concern, Mr. Kimberly. Kim's asleep now, and the nurse is very capable. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is Rosemary Baldwin, Dr. Travis. Good evening. Good evening. You're... You're sure she'll be all right, Doctor? I think so. You two were going out, weren't you? Oh, it's not important... Not if Kim's not feeling well. There's no need to change your plans. Oh, uh, if you have a minute, Mr. Kimberly, if I, I could talk to you. Of course. 
I'll wait in the library, dear. All right. It's a lovely child you have, Mr. Kimberley, and there's nothing wrong with her physically. A little thin, but loss of weight usually goes with loss of emotion. Loss of emotion? Loss of love, whatever you want to call it. She has no mother, she told me. She wants one very much. This, um, this governess she talked about, someone who was here a few months ago. Well? Whoever she is, she seemed to be the closest to a mother that Kim's recently known. So it's the second great loss to her, twice losing the person she felt most secure with. She, she doesn't love me? Of course she loves you. But a feminine love is terribly important to all of us, man as well as child. Did Kim say that I sent Miss Dorothy away? No, no. Kim is angry, but not with you. She's angry with fate for depriving her of so much, so often, so young, all of which she doesn't understand. It deprives all of us. How can you prevent it? A doll is lost, a child cries for it. You show her that another doll can be loved. I don't... Kim doesn't want another one. But if you show Kim that you're strong enough to reach for love again, I'm sure she will, too. Well, I'll stop by in a day or two. Good night. Steve, you still worrying about Kim? Oh, I don't think so. I just don't feel much like a nightclub. Sorry. Well, let's leave then. Now, there's something I want to tell you, Rosemary. In a way, it's, it's an apology. You must find me pretty dull most of the time. You've had a lot on your mind, Steve. Last time I got it off. You see, when I went off to Europe, I, I thought I was getting along pretty well. I'd forgotten my one failure at marriage. Then, recently, it was all stirred up again. Miss Dorothy? I know, Steve. What I didn't guess was... Sue finally told me. She's Kim's mother. Well, then you must realize I... I was coming home to you, and I found her there. It threw me for a while, but I'll get over it. I've no hold on you, Steve. I've always known that some night that the music or the moonlight or, or my overwhelming charm would get the better of you. But I never... Well, let's go home, huh? Well, we can have supper on the terrace and champagne and music and 100% genuine will. Okay? Okay. I should have gone to Paris with you. Then no matter who was here when you came back... Come on, dear. Let's get the car. Hey. How's this? Up to expectations? Mm, heavenly. Uh, and wait till you taste George's lobster. Meanwhile, if you'll excuse me Kim? just a moment. Oh, yeah. But isn't she asleep? Oh, I still have to look in. She'll ask me in the morning. Me too, then. Oh, no, no, I'll be right back. That's how I miss going to Paris with you. Daddy? Yeah. Darling, you should be asleep. I've been waiting for you, Daddy. I wanted to show you something. A letter, dear? It came today to me. It's from Miss Dorothy. Read it, Daddy. To Rosemary, too. Or well, some other time, dear. T tomorrow. Why don't you read it, Steve? Please, Daddy. It's all right. You can turn on the light. All right. It says, My dear Kim. She calls me hers. You must have wondered what happened to me when I went away so suddenly. Why I went doesn't matter as long as it had nothing to do with you. I love you very much. This is the wonderful thing about love. It continues even when people don't see each other. Louder, Daddy. Your voice sounds funny. Well, I... It's the light, darling. I can't see very well. Well, go on. Your father loves you very much, too. That's enough to make any little girl very proud and happy. In case you're missing me, try to hide it for his sake. Don't hurt him ever. All my love to you and my best to your father. And all the time I thought you went away because you didn't like each other. But now I know that you do. Steve. Yeah? The envelope. It's... It's postmarked Ontario, Oregon. I can write to her, can't I, Daddy? Yes, darling, of course. Well, good night, you two. It's, it's been a very nice evening.
Now, Ontario, Oregon is not what you'd call a metropolis. If you're looking for someone, it's just a matter of finding the right farm. And Steve found it. What's... what's wrong with the little dog? Steve! Well, what's wrong with him? Oh, well, he... he caught his foot in the fence. He'll be all right now. Hospital training comes in handy. Mm-hmm. Well, I was always pretty good with the livestock, even as a kid. See that cow over there? She broke her leg once, and I fixed her up, and, and you know that she won second prize at the 4-H fair? Now, you stop making so much noise. You'll be good as new in a week. Chris, I... I've been pretty stupid. I'd come here to ask if we could start again. Not... Not the way I've been, but the way I was when we met, needing you every minute. You're not doing this just for Kim, are you? No, I'm not that unselfish. I want you, Chris. I love you so much. Steve, my my folks, I want you to meet them. Yes, it's about the time they met the man you're going to marry. In a moment, our stars will return. Sergeant Kenneth Kaiser was the first man of the 40th Infantry Division to die in Korean combat. And his memory is perpetuated today in the Kenneth Kaiser High School, the first coeducational high school in all Korea. It's a tribute, too, to the men of the 40th who wanted a living memorial to one of their heroes. The bodies of Sergeant Kaiser raised the $16,000 that went into its construction. They planned the building and they provided much of the labor. 285 boys and girls there proudly wear the tiny enameled metal pins that are replicas of the insignia of the 40th Division. It's a dynamic continuing memorial that has promise of making its influence felt for generations to come. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings, with our stars. Please step forward to the footlights, June Allison and Jeff Chandler. (laughs) Jeff, I understand you've given up the part of that Indian chief who made you so famous. Oh, you mean Cochise? Well, yes, I I turned in my tomahawk when I was given the role of Steve in tonight's play. Then how about your... Your new Technicolor picture for Universal International, War Arrow. Well, now, there are two sides to an Indian fight, June. This time I'm in the U.S. Cavalry and a co-star with Maureen O'Hara. Oh, you mean you're going to play a white man from now on? Why, sure. (laughs) I figured if I couldn't beat you, I might as well join you. (laughs) Well, we're glad you're on our side. Now, how about telling us what you're planning... Oh, what are you planning for next week? Well, next week we're going to present one of the greatest screen favorites of all time. It'll be our first appearance since returning from Europe recently. That famous personality and versatile actress, Claudette Colbert. Miss Colbert has chosen to appear in her original role in an exciting mystery drama from Universal International Studios, Thunder on the Hill. And as her co-star, a beautiful and talented girl who is on her way to well-earned stardom, Barbara Rush. Oh, it'll be wonderful to hear Claudette again. Good night. Good night. Good night. It was wonderful because of you. Heard in our cast tonight were Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Gordon, William Johnstone as Dr. Breen, Kay Stewart as Susan, Tony Barrett as Mike Monroe, Lynn Allen as Rosemary, Herb Butterfield as Dr. Travis, Leonard Penn as Phil, Paul Fries as Senor Misto, and Byron Kane, Mimi Gibson, Dorothy Brown, and Eddie Marr. The Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.